All right, everybody. Uh, thanks again for joining. Jason Witt up here, VP of Marketing from Metadata.io. Uh, we're bringing you a free <laughs> live. Wait, did y'all pay your cover charge? Um, we're bringing you a free live webinar today, all about LinkedIn conversation ads. Um, what they are, strategies for using them. Uh, and then we're going to go through some example campaigns that the folks on the panel and I have run over the last year or so. What we've learned, successes we've had, failures, some KPIs associated with them. And then we'll wrap up with some Q&A. Um, I'm sure folks out there have questions about conversation ads. Um, and we'll try and answer them. So without, I guess, if you've got questions, there's a Q&A box. Go ahead and just start to put those in there at any time during the webinar. We'll get to those, uh, like I mentioned, at the end. We're hoping to have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of this session. So let's get started. Uh, bop, bop, bop. Cool. So here's the agenda for today. Like I mentioned, we'll introduce ourselves real quick. Who are all of these folks talking to you about conversation ads? We'll talk about what are they? What are conversation ads? How do you set them up? Um, what are some of the things that we do specifically that may not be uh, readily apparent? You know, that how we set them up so we get so we get the best performance out of them. Uh, then we'll go through each of us will go through some of like an example campaign that we've each run. And there's some interesting campaigns. We've all done a little bit different things in here. Uh, what we learned from it, some of the results, what we expected to happen. Um, and that'll hopefully give you some inspiration and some things to think about and try. And then, like I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll wrap up with some Q&A. Um, most of y'all who know me know I'm pretty informal around this kind of stuff. So um, my dog, Maggie, my sidekick, Maggie, might come in at some point and need something. I might have to <laughs> pass it to somebody else. We'll see. Um, and we promise there will be some entertainment value associated with the webinar today. So we'll be sure and like try and spice it up and, and and make things uh, a little bit more fun than normal. All right, with that said, let's look at all these beautiful faces we have on here today. So uh, I'm not gonna start with myself, but I'll go through the three folks that we have on. I'll ask them to introduce themselves and then we'll get started. So I'll start with Maurice Maxwell, Senior Digital Marketing Manager from Launch Darkly, a customer of ours as well. Uh, Maurice, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you do? Oh, Jason, I thought you were going to do it all. <laughs> I'm just I can't. Um, yeah, Maurice Maxwell. Um, I am at Launch Darkly. At Launch Darkly, we basically help all software teams deliver and ship code through something we call feature flags. I kind of know what it is. Can't really explain it that well, but <laughs> um, nice. it's, a, it's a pretty high tech. Um, uh, business, but we were growing a lot and a uh, fun place to be. Awesome. Awesome. Maurice, thanks for being on. Uh, I know you guys have been running, you know, you guys have been running with us for a while. You and Mike Smith, uh, we really appreciate, um, yeah, you guys being customers and helping us out with this. Yeah, I'm Next a up, customer, actually. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I was um, Sparkly and another company. Yeah, that's what, we, that's what we like. We like the repeat customers. Um, Next up is Chris Ibogaye, and I said that right. I promise y'all, he said I did it right, so that's good. Uh, growth Marketing Manager at Labelbox, another customer of ours. Chris, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Uh, so yeah, I'm the Growth Marketing Manager at Labelbox. What we do is uh, we have what we like to call a training data platform, and it just allows AI teams and machine learning teams to label images, video, text, whatever data they have. And then with that trained up data, uh, the data scientists, ML engineers, AI engineers, they can use that to help train their models for their AI applications. So I, I help run the paid advertising at Labelbox. Nice. Yeah, that's a fairly technical product too. I, tef I definitely understand oh. it. I, uh, well, I understand it, but I don't get it kind of, you know what I mean? Like I understand what the training sets are for, but man, it's really complicated. So Chris, thanks for being on. And again, thanks for being a customer. Third up, we have Silvio Perez. He is now part of Metadata, our head of ad ops. Um, 
I've actually been working with Silvio for five, four or five months, maybe. Um, he was helping us out uh, as a consultant on our end with, uh, on my team with some paid advertising and then also with our product team, helping to develop uh, actually some of our next sets of features. So Silvio, why don't you intro yourself? Yeah, happy to be here with all you wonderful people. Um, super excited to learn myself as a marketer, always trying to learn from other great minds. Really excited for the campaigns we have going. A little bit about myself. I was a former customer of Metadata, uh, working at Upkeep CMMS. We're a maintenance management software, helping streamline operations for maintenance professionals. So really helping them move offline traditional pen and paper using a CMMS to really just streamline their operations. Nice, we're happy to have you. Um, and then there's me, um, Jason Witta, VP of Marketing for Metadata.io. I've been at Metadata for total a little bit over a year and a half, full-time the last year plus some change. Um, before Metadata, I was primarily a marketing ops person, analytics, process, technology. Uh, and now I'm doing the marketing, the full marketing thing. So. Uh, happy to be here and let's jump into the content enough about ourselves. I keep doing that wrong window. There we go. So let's just start at the beginning. What's a conversation ad, y'all? Um, the basic way I like to describe it is it's a choose your own adventure chat bot that's delivered inside of LinkedIn messaging. I don't know how else to describe it, but you all know you're familiar with your LinkedIn messaging. We've all received sponsored in mail before, which is just like a recruiter or a salesperson that's paying or using a credit to send us a message, a targeted message. Um, well, about, I don't know, probably a year and a half ago, LinkedIn expanded that to these conversation ads. And so what you can do is you can build a conversational flow with statements and then specific responses. And then based on those specific responses, what's the next message that you wanna send them? And you can carry somebody through a fairly complicated branched conversation that's fairly personalized to them as well, all within the LinkedIn messaging area. Um, so I don't know, gentlemen, is there a better way to describe it? Is there something that I missed out on a feature of, of LinkedIn conversation ads or how do you guys describe it, anybody? Well, okay, I guess I did a perfect job. <laughs> no, I, I, think you, I think you hit it square on. The way I like to think about conversation ads essentially is you are given all these different options to create a tailored experience to the prospect that you're sending your message to. And really what you do with it is up to you because conversation ads gives you so much capability to be able to personalize that conversation just at scale. Yep. Yep. And you can use it for so many different things. So not just lead generation, but you can use it for content. You can use it for like webinar registrations like this, um, website visits. There's just a ton of things you can do. And as we talk through this, you'll see why some of those other objectives also work because of the cost of the conversation ad it can be so low. And so, uh, so yeah, let's get into it even more. The details. So here we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've learned over the last year, just that are generally good strategies to use when you're working on a LinkedIn conversation ad. So first, of course, we're going to start with targeting because, well, at least in my experience with not just conversation ads, but really with most marketing is the biggest or the best lever that I have for campaign performance is who I'm targeting the ad to. I can have a mediocre ad targeted to the right audience and it'll outperform an amazing ad targeted to the wrong audience. And so I take that into consideration and really heavily focus on targeting with whatever we do, but specifically with LinkedIn conversation ads, we've tried a lot of different targets. A couple points here specific to conversation ads. First, you have the ability to target natively in LinkedIn, just like any other LinkedIn campaign. So you can use all the standard LinkedIn segments like industry, company size, job title, years of experience, blah, 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 blah. You guys all know that. 
Um, so that's the easiest one. You can layer on things like member groups and LinkedIn. We tried that not that long ago. Huge success with that. Mark actually tried it. Um, and there are other things you can do as well. You can create lists outside of LinkedIn and then upload company lists, upload contact lists. Again, just same you can do in normal LinkedIn, but other things to try. Intent audiences, just you know anything that you can get your hands on. Uh, and then obviously a best practice in there is using exclusion lists. Some of you on this call may be customers of mine that received a conversation ad after you were a customer. Sorry about that. Targeting is not exact. And even I've seen, even with our exclusion lists, I've actually seen customers still get an ad even when they're on the exclusion list. So we try our best, but really get, you know, get good about the, about the exclusion list too, because you, don't, you obviously don't want to pay for anything that's you don't need to pay for. But again, because conversation ads are fairly inexpensive, um, there's room or buffer in there for it. All right, second point, and gentlemen, just literally ding and stop me if you have a point that you want to say about targeting. Um, I will say something about that targeting. Jason. Yes. I was actually one of those clients who got a LinkedIn message from you guys. Yep, yep, it happens. And so, you know, and, and what's nice though is, guess what? Marketers will tell you when you mess up. And so oftentimes yeah. I'll get a LinkedIn message like, hey, Jason, this is the seventh one I've received from you. I've said no every time. Like maybe there's something you can do about it. Yeah, <laughs> there is. And I figure out, well, how do I go and like exclude them? And so we like, I like the feed. I mm -hmm. like the feedback, but just remember, you know, we're all humans, you know, we're trying the best we can. It's not like I'm trying to target you, you know, if you're a customer uh, and I am doing, you know, what I can to try and take you out of that. But Again, sorry if that's happened to you. One thing, Jason, I did want to add on targeting, especially if you're targeting member groups and you're offering gift cards as an incentive. One of the things that I found, unfortunately, the hard way is when you're targeting member groups, there's a lot of students in those groups and okay. people who are just mm -hmm. researching and not necessarily your ICP. So making sure that you're layering an additional filter to be able to exclude those students and learners, whether that's just excluding titles of student, intern, et cetera. Um, but that, that was a really big one because we had a lot of students or you know people who are not part of our ICP trying to take us up on a gift card. Oh yeah, students love free stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's definitely a good point. And you know, there's been changes that LinkedIn has done recently to targeting, I think mainly because of some of the privacy stuff going on with like iOS and things like that, where for example, you used to be able to do target job titles all day. And then in the exclusion list, you could put job functions in there. So what I would do is I put all my marketing job titles and on the right, I'd see, oh, there's still functions of sales, business development in there. Let me just go exclude business development and sales as a function and they go away. Well, that you can no longer do. So now when you use titles in inclusion, you can't use functions in the exclusion. And so you're limited a little bit. So you got to get really good about your exclusion list on titles now, not just functions and understand what titles are under those functions to exclude. And so, yeah, it's something to really pay attention to because again, you don't want to waste money. And that collaborating said, though, closely with sales. That, that was a yes. big one too. I, I yes. would tell all the, all my sales team members, you know, I'm your vent buddy. Let me know if you get a crap lead, like DM me, yes. send me a message, shoot me over the Salesforce uh, record. And with all that information, not just from what you're seeing on, you know, within LinkedIn ads and, and the leads coming in, if they're lead gen forms, um, but also from the people on the front line is really important to build that exclusion list. I will say something about the size of the audience. So because of the way it delivers, you want your audience size to be at least 50,000. When I first started these, I could get away with a 20,000 size audience and it would deliver really, really well. It's become a little bit more competitive. And so I think even LinkedIn now recommends that the size of your audience is at least 50,000. And so that's kind of what I shoot for now as well. Um, cool, let's talk about budgets. So uh, how do you set budgets? What do you want to think about? Not too much here, but just what I do. So you got to think about how these get delivered. As each one's delivered, it just sits in the inbox. So it's not like it was an impression that somebody just scrolled through and it was delivered and done. For example, I just looked at my data this morning. I have two conversions this like from yesterday from a campaign that hasn't even run in May or in June at all. It last ran in May. All of a sudden, two conversions come from it. It's because it's like email. It gets sent into the email box and then it sits there until somebody actually sees it. It doesn't go away. And so what I try and do is so I can get learnings faster is I make my daily budget 
a thousand dollars usually for a new test because usually it won't spend that much honestly based because of the audience size and the delivery but i set it at a thousand so i can see what will it spend and then i'll let that go until i spend about a thousand or two thousand dollars so i can just get those messages out there as fast as possible and then i wait about a week to see you give people time to like read their messages come back to it etc and so that's what's a little bit different about this versus just a scroll you know a feed scroll ad basically where it's very transactional it goes through it counts the impression but the person may have never really actually seen it um and then in terms of there's a bid amount and linkedin will recommend a bid amount it's i've never seen it above a dollar it's usually between 50 and 60 cents, oftentimes lower than that. A strategy that I've done so that I make sure I win every auction is I just set my bid at a dollar. So I set it well above what LinkedIn says is the maximum because it's not just going to spend a dollar. It's just going to bid high enough to get the win up to a dollar. I've never, ever had a dollar or a dollar over, sorry, over a dollar on my per bid, basically. Um, gents, what other suggestions you guys have around budgets? I would say if you're being more conservative and you have a smaller budget you're dealing with, perhaps starting with a lower cost per cost per send and then raising your bids over time. Um, that way, because if you do set it right off the bat at let's say a dollar, you know, I've never had to pay that much either, but God forbid you did have to, just as like a, a fail safe, just start with a high daily budget, low cost per send, and then gradually over time, um, make sure that you're actually serving and spending your entire daily budget. That's smart. I agree with that. Prove it out first. Make sure that it's performing well, and then increased to to you know beat out competition. Yeah, I'll, I'll say at Label Box, one thing that we've seen as we've increased bids, we haven't necessarily seen increases in our cost per send or our cost per delivers. The mm. real difference that we have seen is just overall delivery. We're just winning more auctions. So as we increase our bids, we just are able to send our messages out a little bit more effectively. Yeah. I wonder if that's because not as many people are doing conversation ads yet. So the auction is so low right now. Yeah. But over time, like after this webinar, <laughs> <laughs> what it would look like. Yeah. Why are we doing this webinar, guys? Yeah, actually, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. That's great. That's great feedback. And, um, and by the way, uh, we will have this recorded and available for everybody. Um, and we're going to turn this into a content piece for folks as well. That'll have all these little, you know, little nuances that we're talking about baked into that document. So, but that might take a couple of weeks. So um, just know that's coming. Uh, three, who the message comes from. So as you can see uh, up here, you get to select the sender of the message and you can essentially can send you can you can send a request for somebody to be a sender to literally anybody on LinkedIn. It doesn't have to be within your company. You don't just automatically see people in your company to select from. Um, you have to invite them to be a sender, and they have to approve being a sender. Um, and so it can come from anybody. My recommendation from the beginning is it should the person who it's coming from should be relevant to the person receiving the message. They should have the same job. They should have the same problems. You know, something where the person sending it or who it's coming from can relate or the person that's getting it can relate to the person that it's coming from because that automatically creates a little bit more trust. Oh, this person is using it in this way at their own company kind of a thing. Or this person has the same problems that I have and hence I should probably listen. Um, so sometimes that means it doesn't come from your CEO. It doesn't mean like the highest person in the company. It should should it come from? In fact, I don't know a lot of cases where that might be relevant, unless maybe you have a CEO that has a little bit more high profile, you know, might be a little bit more well known, or, you know, there might be times to test it where just the CEO title itself, somebody might see an, a message and like, oh, from a CEO somewhere, like, oh, that might be interesting. Again, something to test. This is a very, very important lever to test. Um, we've had people that I've advised that are like, oh, you know, we're basically talking to product managers. Well, okay, I'm sure you're a software product, you have a product manager, literally have it come from your guys' own project product manager, you know, and Maurice, so you guys probably do, maybe you guys did the same thing or um, so, so you far know, we've sent it, what's that? No, keep going. Oh, so far we've sent it from me, we tried it from Mark, we tried it from our CEO, Gil, 
Um, my next one though is I'm gonna send it from a customer. So I'm gonna, I'm getting, I've actually, I have one. I won't mention the person's name. Thank you, who, <laughs> who you know who you are. Get a rabid fan of your product and see if they'd be willing to have the message come from them. Of course, involve them and the whole, like the message has to sound like it comes from them. They have to set, you know, that has to feel good and right. Um, but, and I don't know yet, we're gonna, we haven't tried it out yet. I think it's gonna work well, but imagine just getting a message like from somebody that you, you do the same job and they're just saying, hey, I've been using this for a while. I'm getting a lot of benefit from it. You should just check it out, you know, as a peer to peer. So I think it might work. I think it might be pretty interesting. And then you reciprocate, like, you know, I will do this. I'll do the same thing for this person. I'll, cause we use their technology as well. And so I can kind of reciprocate and do the same thing. And so I think that's really interesting. Um, have you guys done much testing with like who the message comes from and got any learnings around that? I know we, we, we actually just use a salesperson. Oh, um, you do. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we have had, nice. like, and surprisingly we've had some really good success. Um, but that's, that's something that we're actually testing right now with a um, salesperson versus a product person. Yeah. And things are going okay. So far. <laughs> yeah, I usually tell people don't have it come from a salesperson. Like that should be the last person. But man, Maurice is testing it and it's working. Um, Chris, any learnings on who it comes from? Yeah, so we have historically used our CTO uh, primarily because we are selling to engineers. Um, it just made the most sense for us to use someone who we feel like had the most authority when it came to our domain. It's something that we are continuing to test. So we're using our CEO. Um, we thought about using our CMO and just seeing if, you know, that could potentially work as well. Jason, I loved your idea of using a customer. I'm probably going to steal that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think there's a, a bunch of ways we can to us. Nice. Uh, all right. I'm going to jump into these next ones because I looked at the time and man, where does the time go? So next one, very first message that you send. So the thing to know about this mm -hmm. is there is in fact the notion of a preheader in LinkedIn messages. It's shorter than a normal email preheader. You can just take a look at your own LinkedIn and kind of see what that looks like. And you know what a preheader is, it's what you can see before you actually click on the message. Um, so what I try and do now is I try and get the offer into the preheader if I can, so that they can see it right away. So if I'm offering a hundred dollar gift card, hey, I have a hundred dollars for you. Like that's the first, that's basically the first sentence and they can see it in the preheader. Pre the other things that are important in the first message is basically tell them who you are why you targeted them, why they should care, and then what to do next. So you have 500 characters to do all of that. Um, so usually what works well, social proof, especially if you have low awareness in your category. So, you know, what I might say is revenue, like good revenue marketers from places like Zoom or Drift or Gartner or whatever, you know, whoever our clients are. And use our platform to drive, you know, high volumes of pipeline using campaigns, you know, whatever I want to say after that, what we, how we do it, that just instills like, I might not know you, I might not know your company, but I know those three customers. And if they're customers, again, it just kind of builds some of that trust. Um, and then of course the offer and then what to do next. So are you interested? No. And always give them a no option. Don't just like force them into a yes. Right. So yes, no. Um, and if they say no, then no, you can do something after that. Um, Silvio, learnings on the first message. Yeah, no, it's critical. I've found a, from testing a difference between like 50 and 77% in open rates just from the first message. It very much like email, it's your subject line. That's how I like to think about it. And you want it to be compelling so people can click through. The other thing I found as well too is th the first message is very important from an open perspective, but the last message is very important from a click-through rate perspective for them clicking through from the, the link in your... Um, in your conversation add over to your lead gen form or to your landing page. And also one thing I wanted to add to on the previous topic about who the message comes from. One of the things we did was we had our SVP of marketing battle off against our CEO and we actually had fun with it. And we made it like a, like an internal challenge to see who would get more conversions. And that was a good like way it. early on to get buy-in across the company. I like it. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good. <laughs> I'm sure we could do that internally here too. get Olivier and Gil going at it. <laughs> Uh, cool. Uh, I'm gonna keep jumping. So number five, additional info and qualifications. So once you get them interested, you can take them through a lot of different messages just to further qualify them. So 
what's likely happening with you is you have a certain ICP that you're going after, but there might be some features in that ICP that you just can't easily target based on the targeting information available. So for us at Metadata, we, our best customers, well, the customers that have the best benefit from Metadata spend at least $10,000 a month in paid social advertising. So that's not a, I, unless somebody on this call can tell me, I've not found a data source yet that can tell me how much somebody spends in paid social across LinkedIn and Facebook. So that's one of the questions we ask to qualify them further. So you're the right company, I can do that through targeting. You're the right title, I can pretty much do that through targeting, even though like it's not an exact science. But do you spend $10,000 a month on paid social? No idea. So I got to ask you that if I truly want to make sure I'm sending sales the right people. Um, other things like technologies they use, complementary supporting technologies that you might need them to use. Um, if they're a decision maker, and when I'm offering when I'm offering hundred dollars for a demo meeting, I put in the message, not this way. I don't remember how I say it, but don't mess around. Like please, like I'm not I'm not just willy nilly offering you hundred dollars. You know. I'm targeting you as best I can. And I wanna make sure that there's a reason for you to come on it. And then it's worth a hundred dollars. And so I put a little, I don't, I say it in a sentence. So it's, it's pretty fast, but, um, and we used to not do that. And then we started doing that. It actually reduced, cause you're going, you know, if you offer a hundred dollars in exchange for anything you're gonna get some tire kickers in the door just trying to get your hundred dollars. But usually in our fields, in our industries there's not a lot of those people out there. Um, but this is a way to further get them out. Have you guys done anything else with like qualification, Maurice? Yeah, I mean, we definitely use the qualify, qualifying things. We ask them, you know, are you are you managing an engineering team? Does, but we'll ask them like, hey, is what we're offering something that appeals to you? Oh, I like that. And, and yeah. uh, we've had some pretty good success with that. That's awesome. Chris, how about you guys? Yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't necessarily ca characterize it as qualifying, more of optimizing the messaging in a way that allows us to make sure that we're going after uh, the higher quality users. So yeah. for example, um, we're focused on content downloads after someone might select to um, fill out a lead to download the content, then we might ask them to sign up for a demo or something along those lines, just to make sure that they are continuously engaged with us um, in a like way it. that just focusing on the content download might not. Nice. So is that in the same, actual, the same exactly. conversation ad? You go content and then you actually go for a demo as well? Exactly, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I never even thought about that. That's cool, cool. All right. We, I, I, we actually do the opposite. We'll, we'll say, hey, oh, yeah. let's do, uh, do you want a demo? No, you don't want a demo? How about we, here's an offer that would be compelling to you. Yep, yep. So you start at the top and try and then you work your way back from there. And Chris yeah. is trying to work up to it basically, like offering some value first and then kind of coming back for the, yeah, I like it. Um, awesome, okay, I'm gonna get into the last one real quick on testing and optimization, do it. <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things you can test. I, I mean, this is, you always do testing and optimization, mm. right? If you don't, you're leaving money on the table, but especially with this, because there's so many different levers that you have. Look, we just talked through some things, who it comes from. That's not a lever you have in any other ad, you know what I mean, really, except email really, right? Who it's coming from. But even an email, it's just a name. Here you get the name, the title, the picture, you know, and all that stuff. And so I guess that's another thing. Make sure that the picture of the person it's coming from <laughs> looks legit. You know what I mean? Like actually looks like somebody you'd want, you know, it's welcoming and inviting. I'll be completely honest, Gil might hate me for this. I asked Gil to change his profile picture, you know, like six or seven, <laughs> six or seven months ago. Um, Cause I was just like, hey, there's, there's this better picture. I like this one much better. Let's try this one. Um, and yeah, so I think again, that's subjective, but it's something you can test, you know, you can actually test it on that um, note, also having an optimized LinkedIn profile. So having a banner yes. that supports your CTA as well, because a lot of people do click through to your profile to scoop yes. you out. That's exactly right. And that's why, that's another reason why who it comes from is so important because you can just click on their name above, go right to their profile. So if you click on them, you've got some like either a fake LinkedIn account or somebody that's like. A CEO is their first job they've ever had. You know what I mean? They've been they've been in the, on LinkedIn for a year. You know, it's going to look a little weird, and people like, is this real? But you know, if you've got a real profile there of somebody that is reputable, you know, and been on LinkedIn for a while and has some experience, that's great. 
run a LinkedIn audit on your senders before <laughs> approving. Yeah, give them some advice. All right. Uh, with that said, we're going to jump right into these ex these uh, experiments that we each did and talk through them. So I think Maurice, you are up first. Let's talk about your demo request campaign. Yeah, sure. So I'll I'll be quick because I know we're we're pushing time. But yeah, basically here at Launch Starkly, our our goal is to push demo requests. Um, we have basically really wanted to just offer this. $50, $50 DoorDash gift card to key decision makers who have engaged with, with Launch Darkly, either with you know coming on the website, downloading content, but haven't moved through the funnel. So, um, and our audience here, basically senior level, senior manager level or higher engineering ex exec executives or, or what have you, people who are managing people. Um, and then we really wanted people in growth companies. Um, that's another targeting thing that they have in LinkedIn, companies that grow 3%, 10%, 20%. Um, but those are typically co companies who are using modern development practices. So that was kind of in our, our ICP that we, we really wanted to target. And then we had that $50 uh, DoorDash gift card was our, our offer. Um, and we we really wanted i really wanted to call this lunch darkly instead of launch darkly. Ah, nice um, yes i put that all <laughs> over in our stuff but it got mixed um oh i love that Dang I, it. I thought it'd be interesting um yes. but basically our flow is over here on the right um but basically we just have a generic pitch i think it's a really good pitch but it's generic, <laughs> um, but definitely have that social proof in there saying like, hey, we have some great companies using us. Um, yeah. uh, we help them move faster, deploy it better. Um, let's let's uh, get you a demo so you can find out how you can do it for you. Um, but then we have that, um, this next is that qualifier. Um, and we this the, for, for us, this qualifying, um, response had like kind of like a threefold purpose. First, being able to have people engage with our brand, um, having um, like an open exchange, kind of asking questions to help them consider, to think, and to kind of help them see how our product could help them, um, how I kind of mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, and then the best thing about the, the qualifying question is that if it doesn't apply to them, they're out. So we don't yeah. have to we don't deal with them, save, save their time and but also save our 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 sales people's time, which I would say is more important. Um, if you want to go to the next one. Yeah. Um, so we had some pretty good results. Um, I think this was like six weeks ago. So um, we're our spend is was around four four K. We had a pretty good open rate and our click to open rate, our click to open rate was really good too. Um, our CPL was better, it, like on par, if not better than our normal, like lead gen campaigns on LinkedIn. And surprisingly, these people moved really quickly through the funnel. So we actually started getting pipeline really fast. Um, and that's kind of like our, our biggest measure, but spending 4k and getting 60k in pipeline, I'll do that all day. Yeah. Um, but some of the biggest learnings that I was able to get um, from this and um, from other experiments that I've done with this is making sure you really have a laser focused ICP. Uh, make sure it's well thought out. Make sure to that it's it's been proven. Um, I, I and this might be a way a good way for you you guys to prove it out. But I would say it's it's better to have a really laser focus before you do this. Um, but in that, we did a lot of exclusions. Um, we have like, like how Jason, you said earlier, we have a lot of student titles that are really closely aligned to engineering titles. So we did the home, our homework before and made sure to have all of those student titles um, as exclusions. Um, but then uh, one of the things that I really liked, again, is that qualifying question, um, qualifying question, qualifying response. Um, basically just, like I said before, helps people engage with the brand. Um, it's really valuable for our sales team because you're 
creating a valuable conversation because these people know that they're kind of what they're getting into, but also they're they're prepped. They're like, all right, I know what this what what you guys kind of offer here, so let's do it. Um, and then last, just make sure to test your copy. We we ran with three variations and tested each one. Um, and each one of them, if we would have just gone with one, we would have sucked um, and yeah. <laughs> did not perform well at all. Um, but one last recommendation I would, I would recommend here is make sure to include images in your ads because it, it's, it's an optional thing. Yeah. But if people are viewing these on desktop, there's a spot there for another ad to show up. So yep. you could be, you know, have honed in on your copy, have great um, qualifying questions, developing developing exchanges, and then uh, your That's competitor's sure. offer could be right there, and they could click out, click into it. So um, yeah. So what he, what Maurice is talking about is this section here. So you can use this banner creative that's optional. Um, and when that person clicks it, let's go to my messages real quick. Uh, here's a sneak peek into my LinkedIn world, y'all. Um, maybe. <laughs> Jason, if you want to let me share a screen, I can share my screen right like quick. Perfect. So yeah, you that's great. An example of it. There you go. Oh, just share this real quick. So you can see here, this is this is the start of our message. There we go. On the right side, you can see that this, and we tested this obviously. So you can see that this one has the offer, but this one does not. So I can mm -hmm. have all this stuff in ways is right there trying to take my traffic. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that was a much better example than mine. <laughs> cool. Perfect. That's great. Yeah, that's what he's learned. I'd be curious to know if a uh, DoorDash gift card does better than Amazon gift card. Like which one? You know what? I actually had yeah. a lead come in from a DoorDash engineer. Wow. <laughs> I thought it was like Inception. Yeah, we had we had Uber Eats come in, which was funny. And they actually asked us, hey, if we become a customer, will you change the offer to an Uber Eats card? I'm like, sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Just, sure. If you Uber Eats comes in and becomes a customer, yeah, absolutely. Because like everyone uses Amazon. So that was kind of the idea, right? You know, they do. Maybe some I have some luck with Amazon too. Yeah, yeah. But that'd be a good test. Yeah, that's actually a good test. I should try I should try both of them. But then I could have called lunch lunch darkly. So <laughs> I love that. All right, Chris, take us through your content download campaign. All right. Yeah. So for our conversational campaigns, um, we decided to focus on content downloads for Labelbox uh, because it is a little bit more technical. Uh, we feel like it is best to prime users, our prime potential customers uh, with our content uh, before we launch into more in-depth conversations like a demo. So we really focus on sending out these ads from our head of technology to make sure that uh, our, ha our ads had that authority so people would be more likely to um, engage with them. So in terms of our ICP, we were really focused. We have a very um, strict and very narrow ICP. There's only so many people and so many um, companies that would be a good fit for Labelbox. Uh, so we'd really focus on ML engineers, AI engineers, and data scientists. And here on the right, I have an example of, of one that um, we have deployed. You can see that I started very personalized with the, with um, high first name in there. That's something that we found has worked very well for us. And like Maurice said, uh, making sure that we have uh, like actual images in our conversational ads has been key for us. And um, has just led to higher engagement and overall uh, has led to more people signing up for uh, to download the actual content. Yeah, like at one quick note, because I forgot to mention these variables like first name, there are other ones as well. So there are company, industry, other variables you can use, just word of caution. A lot of people use those and it sounds like a robot. So I don't use anything other than first name because, hey, if you're a blah -bitty blah from a blah -bitty blah industry, it's just like, you know, they just kind of know, I think. So be careful with the amount of those variables that you use. Sorry, Chris, keep going. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was ultimately, yeah. Oops. 
So for us, um, in terms of the results, uh, we saw very strong open rates. Um, click to open was not as strong, but ultimately we were very um, happy with our CPLs. Um, we were seeing about a 44% lower CPL than our LinkedIn ads that were serving the same um, content. Um, so overall, pretty much blowing our, our regular ads out of the water. Uh, in terms of our learnings, one thing that we did see was that the people who did download uh, our content from our conversational ads were less likely to engage with our other content on our website uh, or ultimately becoming an opportunity than our regular ads. So that took some time for us to optimize our messaging when it came to our ads, both in our conversational ads. So like I mentioned earlier, we what we decided to do was add that demo option so people we could push people down the funnel then also after they had downloaded the content with our follow-up email uh we had to have a special flow for people in the conversational ads uh just to make sure those people were moving down the funnel in a way that um they, they weren't previously another learning for us was focusing on lowering our delivery costs what we had seen is that the larger an audience was, the lower our cost per deliver was. And we didn't really see that much of a difference when it came to engagement with uh, even as we increase our audience size. So I think like everyone else has been saying, you want to make sure your ICP is very refined. You want to make sure you're not going after students or people who, who just have no interest in your product. But once you're able to really focus in on that, make sure your audience is big enough and then you can get the, the low delivery costs that ultimately um, back out into our strong CPLs. And then finally, uh, probably one of the biggest learnings has been just making sure the conversational flow is just not too long. Uh, we focus on only having a couple of different messages. We focused on making sure that our message wasn't, you know, five paragraphs, we wanted to make sure that uh, we got to the point, uh, it was very easy for our potential customers to understand what we were selling. And then ultimately we just decreased the conversion funnel. So they were able to download their content on a snap. I like it. If I had a nickel for every time Mark told me that exact statement, hey man, brevity, yeah. <laughs> I'd be <a> rich man. <laughs> Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Um, Silvio, you're up next. Talk about your demo campaign at uh, Upkeep. Yeah, absolutely. So this was the, the objective of this campaign was more remarketing focus to push maintenance professionals that were on the fence. They already engaged with us online. They visit our site. They visit our company page. And really to get these people who are on the fence to essentially jump and, and cross the threshold and to talk to sales and move further into the process. So we were, the objective was to drive more demo requests. Another reason too was, you know, we found conversation ads to be a great way to scale out of traditional channels that do have scaling limits, right? Like paid search, paid review. There's only so much more people searching. There's only so much more you can bid on Captera before they charge you an arm and a leg to get to the top spot. So this was another good avenue for us. And the offer we were using was a $50 Amazon gift card. And this was our first message. So kind of going back to the whole thing about the first sentence, you know, the first thing you see is, hi, Sylvia, I'd like to send you $50 for your Amazon shopping. So that's the first thing they see in their inbox. And I can actually share my screen, Jason, if you want to show the flow. Do you see my screen? Yep, it's coming up. Awesome. So this is the first message here. And, and to Maurice's point, you want to use a banner image. So you dominate this real estate here on the right-hand side and uh, Waze doesn't take it from you. So that's important. And another thing too, on the, on the note of like, not only when you start the message, but getting them to open, to increase that, that click-through rate in your in-mail, um, your sponsored conversation ad is the last message. So I, I, for me through testing, I found like adding some urgency, some scarcity worked to get people to act. Again, this was a remarketing campaign as well too. So you have to also keep in mind the the audience that you're going after and really tailoring your your voice um, to that uh, another thing too is we had trouble with non-qualified people getting our our demos so using label text to really solidify how they qualify for this offer was very important so i worked with sales on this 
and essentially putting, you know, they put, how do I qualify? And it's just very obvious. Like this is exactly what needs to happen in order for you to qualify. And then from here, taking advantage of the consistency bias, right? They already started this message flow. You have their attention downsell them into the next subsequent offer. So from here, if they're not ready for a demo, they can just say, not looking right now to Jason's point, don't just stuff a demo on them. If they don't want it, let them have options. So then from here, we downsell them into a trial. No worries. Would you like to sign up for a trial? If they hit yes, it takes them to our trial page. If they hit no, then it downsells them to the, all the way to the bottom, or I guess in this way you could say top because it's reversed and it's gated content or ungated content, however you're doing it at your organization and just offering them relevant articles and guides. And we've done this at a general level, just to all maintenance managers. And we've also done it industry specific and you can tailor each offer to that industry. So for example, you can do food and beverage for us is one of our industries. So food and beverage content guides, um, how the trial relates to that industry and really just to make sure that that messaging attracts the right person and repels the wrong one. Um, in terms of learnings, you can, uh, you want to pull it up? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> so the, the biggest thing uh, for us was we spent quite a, we really got into a conversation as in Q4 of last year, we spent $23,000 on this campaign. We had a 70% open rate, 4.7% click to open rate. Uh, we generated 235 demo requests, $109 per demo. And we saw 40% of these leads, the, these demo requests to convert that converted over into SQOs. So it was really, really um, effective for us. And one of the big learnings that I got was matching the tone of voice to the audience interest. So taking into account the interest level of your audience and then matching your tone accordingly. So for example, if in my case, I was being a little bit more aggressive because I'm reaching a more warm and hot audience. They already know about uh, who our CEO is. They're familiar with him. They've engaged with us online. So I'm trying to get them to take that next step. But if you're reaching a completely cold audience, you should reach out to them with a more personal touch, a soft touch, uh, you know, more um, inviting, if you will. So really just keep in mind the tone of voice and who you're going after and make sure your messaging is according to that. The other one too is don't fall in love with your CPL. Conversation ads are very attractive. Uh, when you look at your vanity metrics in LinkedIn and you see $100 demos and you think you just won the Olympics and you know it's, it's happy days, but make sure you're collaborating closely with sales and making sure that these are the right opportunities coming through the door. And more important than that, that it's actually closing into revenue and, and you know, backtracking that through your process. We had struggles early on with not the right opportunities coming in. So unfortunately, we learned this the hard way, but don't fall in love with those vanity metrics. And then the last one is don't just stop at the demo. Create conversation flows that downsell prospects into your next most relevant offers. In Google Analytics, um, there are people that will sign up for a demo and then they'll just go through the whole chat flow and then they'll actually get a piece of gated content. Um, so when they show up to the demo, they already had some gated content that they read. So it's like some sales enablement kind of happening through the chat bot uh, in conversation ads. So really just maximizing that real estate has been key. And then another thing too that I didn't put on here was you don't have to offer a gift card in order for a demo to work through conversation ads. I tested the Amazon gift card. I tested without the Amazon gift card. The difference that I did found was the CPL, as you can imagine, is higher without the gift card, but the amount of the, the lead to SQO percentage was greater when you didn't offer the gift card, because as you can imagine, you know, they're taking that demo with the right intentions. And then yeah. the other thing too, that we use conversation ads for as well is, is in addition to just testing your first message for open rates, using it to qualify and really get data around messaging. So for example, for us, we tested first, um, first messages, for example, like angles around compliance and then angles around keeping production moving. And we saw which one is resonating with our audience better. So then you can take those learnings and apply it, not just from conversation ads, but across your entire marketing um, through your website and all your other channels as well. Nice. Cool. Silvio, thank you. I am going to breeze through mine, even though I think this is the most fun one, but... <laughs> So um, I, did a, I did a scavenger hunt. This was about a year ago, I think. Um, full awareness. This was only awareness. This wasn't lead generation. So I basically said, hey, welcome to a metadata scavenger hunt. Um, you go through, basically go through this conversation ad and at the end, there'll be a form. If you answer the questions correctly, 
I'll send you $20. That's it. Simple as that. And we're not going to follow up with you. We're not going to try and sell you. The goal was really to generate deep awareness. So not just like the awareness of like, oh, metadata is out there. They do some stuff with B2B marketing, but like literally knowing our differentiators. I, one of the, like one of the questions on the survey is how many contacts do we have in our, our B2B graph database? Cause I take them through it. So the way they start is, you know, what's the biggest marketing pain point? They click that. And then from there, I tell them if they click building audiences, I tell them exactly how we do, how we build audiences in metadata. Then from there, it's just going through every single one of these other four. They read about that. At the very end of that, they go off to, uh, they went off to a HubSpot or actually not a HubSpot page, just a, a form page on our website. Uh, they answered the questions, even if they got them wrong, I still sent them, you know, the $20. Cause I was like, if they got a couple right, I was like, okay, at least it looks like you tried. Um, and that's, that was it, that was it. We didn't follow up with them. We didn't do anything else after that. So here are some of the results. So I spent about $420, sorry, $4,200. 60-ish uh, percent open rate, 15% click to open, which is pretty great. 98 hunt completions, 50 winners and about $104 per winner. If you consider all the people that went through it, plus what I paid for the $20 fulfillment. And with no follow-up, two opportunities. And so, um, and our opportunities are usually worth $45,000, $50,000, something like that. And so for me, it was good. My problem is I had that one going as at the same time I had these, the demo request one going and I just aired towards the demo request one. I didn't really optimize this one. So I got squirrel syndrome, moved on too soon, could have tightened the audience. The audience wasn't very tight. So that was my first learning. We didn't do any follow-up. That was on purpose, but could we have actually gotten more from it? Even if we just followed up with nurture or something like, and not like a traditional, like crappy nurture, but like, Hey, how you doing? You know, just wanted to follow up with you. Have any questions, that kind of thing. And then different is good. So I actually received a lot of personal outreach from this. Like, what are you doing? Like, this is crazy. Like, I love this, you know? And, and so that also has a lasting, some lasting brand value, you know, if you're doing it right. And so cool. Done with that. Left some questions for, we left some time for Q and A because we have some, Oh, sorry, I'm not done. Ding, 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 sales alert. Jason's selling you something. Hey, by the way, we actually have conversation ads, LinkedIn conversation ads in metadata now. And we've actually taken a little bit of a different, we've reimagined how you create conversation ads. So you can see on the right, that's actually our interface. And what we've done is we've actually collected a lot of pre-vetted flows uh, that people have used, that we've vetted, we've tested, and we've just stuck them into the platform to make it a lot easier for you to start. So check it out when you have time. Now, Q&A. Um, all right, some great questions. I'm just going to take them in order that they came in, I think. So yes, Julian, thank you for reminding me. There is an interesting delivery going on with LinkedIn conversation ads. So an individual person can only get, as far as I understand, one conversation ad delivered to their inbox from an advertiser in a 30-day period. I've heard different flavors of that. Like they can only get one from anybody over a 30-day period or is from a single advertiser over a 30-day period. Either way, you can tell how that would limit the inventory, right? There's nothing like that in the feed. So if you've got a sponsored ad in the feed, it's just going to keep going to the same, you know, if, unless you set frequency caps, you know, it's going to keep just going to the same people. This one won't, at least for 30 days. And so it's something to keep in mind. It's also, in my mind, why there might be some potentially some inventory considerations to think about here. Because if I can only see one of these in a month, imagine the competition for that person. So that was a great point. Thanks, Julian, for reminding me. Um, what kind of reporting do we get from LinkedIn? Can we follow individual prospects particular path? Oh, yes. Um, not an indiv individual, but lots of reporting from LinkedIn. You get sponsored messaging reporting, which is kind of like email metrics, which is your delivered, sent, open, open rate, click to open, cost per lead, cost per send, all that stuff. That's available. Your frequency numbers are available, all the standard LinkedIn. But then they have a flow chart. And I'm not going to try and get into it because I'm going to waste time trying to find it. You're going to you have a flow chart where you can actually look at the Sankey chart, if you guys are familiar with that, that shows like, here's your first question. Here's five people said yes, 10 people said no. Here's the next one. 10 people said yes, five people said no. And it, you can kind of start to get an idea of where the obstacles are or where people are answering questions where you're like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, do you guys have any other reports in LinkedIn around these that you love? For me, it's mainly the sponsored messaging one. Yeah. Yep. The, uh, so you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Seriously. Yep. The, uh, the other thing too is that the, the message auto archives after 30 days and that 
at the end of that. Ah, good to know. Good to know. Um, cool. A uh, question from Chuck around audience sizes. Let's see. Try to do a conversation. So regards a minimum, same minimum audience size, which forces to be less targeted. Yes. So I've experienced this. So exactly. So if you if you if your audience size needs to be big, guess what? You're probably going to have to loosen up the targeting a little bit at the top, especially if you're really like after VP of marketing, CMOS, or you know like really tight audiences. So what I've done for that is I've loosened it up just the minimum amount that I need to to get to the right size. But then I add a qualifying question in my conversation ad so that I basically can get them out of the bottom end before they get through to a demo. It's not the best, but it does still allow you to get to your audience ultimately, but just with you throwing dart, a little a couple more darts at the board on that one. Um, do you guys have any other strategies around that? Nope. All right. Sounds good. Uh, open rates. Click to open rates. Did you find? I think some of us went through that. Um, my... If I have less than a 55% open rate, to me, that's a bad campaign. Um, and that's just because of the averages that I get are usually between 60 and 70% open rate. What I love about it is you can't fake the open rate on LinkedIn, at least yet. We don't have these like spam bots and mail filters and everything that, that pollute email and make email metrics completely garbage, unfortunately. Sorry, email vendors. It's not because of you, it's because of all these mimes and everything out, out there that open the email, click through all the links and then pretend it's a person. You never really know what kind of email engagement you're getting. That doesn't happen with LinkedIn. You know exactly what's happening because they have to like actually look at it in their inbox. And I don't think there's a lot of people writing scrapers to go like click through their LinkedIn messaging. So, um, and I think I saw some of those similar open rates, click to open, you know, Seven, 10, 15%, I think is really doable uh, with a lot of these as well. Um, all right, let's see if there's another one here we can get to. Oh, sorry, I'm answering all these, but I'm just doing no, it no, the time. Um, the one thing though on that on that note too is like, I've had campaigns that have a, a smaller open rate, but they've converted more deals on the back end. So just don't let that be your, you know, your beyond yes. end all, like always make sure you're tying it back to revenue. It's a, it's a lead in metric. It's to like, just to make sure it's like a gut check metric. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. As long as it's in a range, let it go and see what it turns into in terms of opportunities. Um, that's what we should all be doing, honestly. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up so that we don't start to keep talking about stuff and people have to go to other meetings. But gentlemen, thanks again for being on. Everybody that attended, hey, really appreciate you staying on with us. The questions were great. If you have any follow-ups, I see there's been a lot of chat going on. Um, you know how to reach Mark and I, uh, and actually these fine gentlemen as well. Just hit us up on LinkedIn, ask us questions. I'm happy. I've met with so many of pe people and just helped them with their conversation ads or tried to. So, you know, reach out, ask us questions, see if we can help. Thanks everybody for joining. Have a great day. Have a great week. Thanks everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.